Hello everyone. Uh, my name is um, Alex Gordon. I am a uh, I completed my education at SFP in August uh, down in Peninsula, um, having spent two years at Torbay Hospital, and I'm also the current uh, research lead for Access the SFP, uh, where we're doing quite an exciting project on trying to look at um, basically socio demographic variables that may influence people's ability to access specialised foundation programmes. Um, Yes, so I am going to talk about how to approach the personal station um, for about 20 minutes, and then we can probably do some questions straight after, as Luke just said. The benefit being in Zoom mode is, um, or the original Zoom mode, is that we can sort of actually have proper interactivity throughout, although I'll use some Mentimeter stuff. Uh, but the downside is that if your microphone does come on with something embarrassing, you may be immortalized in the recording forever. So just be very, very uh, vigilant with uh, with your space bar and various other bits of what you're doing. Um, but thank you very much for making the effort to attend. So, yes, I am going to talk about how to approach the personal station of an interview. Um, and the first thing I want to know, really, just so we can gauge what is going on, if you log into menti.com, those of you who are not using a... Uh, sort of phone to watch this if at all using the code that's shown there on the slide um, if this works this works if it doesn't it doesn't um, but I just want to know a little bit about how you're approaching your preparation for interview have you started what is your sort of who are you working with no idea yet that's a good uh, good start um, are you if you are working with someone is it regular is it irregular um, are you getting advice? Oh, this is wonderful. It's actually working, which is an educational dream. Okay. Um, okay. Definitely haven't. So, so most people on this haven't started none yet. Working with other medics applying as a group of six. I have mentors that have helped with white space questions, but not sure how to work on interview. Watching as many talks as purpose but not actually put anything into practice yet. Okay, so uh, based on an N of 11, um, basically most people haven't started yet, which is fine. Um, and certainly um, there are pros and cons to um, practicing too early. Um, for example, coming across as over-rehearsed, but that's the whole point of why we're here. So I'm going to try and talk to you less so about what to talk about, but how to prepare for talking in an interview um, as we'll go through. Okay, so there's another interactive bit now. Um, so do you have any structure or have you heard of any structures at all for answering questions in an interview? Bearing in mind that almost everyone on this call will not have done an interview since their entry to undergraduate or postgraduate medicine. Yeah, camp, camp and star, good. Everyone's heard of a little bit of this. Just the star technique, star. Uh, nope. Yeah, that's that's good. I appreciate the honesty with that. And I was the same at this stage. Okay. Anybody else got anything else? It's always helpful to know. Because sometimes we haven't heard of stuff either and it might really help us. Okay, so generally, we've got the two, the camp and the star technique are two things that have commonly been brought up. And uh, yes, so this is kind of, this talk is kind of in two parts. There's kind of what to say, which is less important, um, because actually the content of what you say, I'm going to argue throughout this talk, is less important than how you say it and how you basically put yourself across. There's basically two parts or two types of questions that can come up in a personal interview, right? So there's questions about your motivations. So why do you want to come to this foundation program? Um, why do you want to do a specialized foundation program? Why do you want to be a clinical academic? Um, and that generally is it generally and what's recommended in this book, which I would encourage everybody to either purchase, which you can, I've put the QR code up there, to get access to um generally there are two things so there's motivation so when you talk about in an answer what's the clinical things that mean you want to be there which should probably be a pretty major focus considering 
other than the odd exception, clinical work is five sixths of your life for two years. Um, academic, so what is the sort of research or educational leadership reasons you want to be there? Management comes under it, but I would argue that it's probably not a major component of an academic foundation program, just because you're probably not in a senior in a role yet. And then personal reasons, so the classics would be I have family here or I've been here for university. Then you have situation based questions. So tell us about a time that you had to, I don't know, deal with a difficult interpersonal interaction or tell us tell us about your weaknesses would be another classic. And then you just talk about situation, task, assessment, and then reflect and relate that back to why that situation and why your assessment and why your performance in that situation makes you um, a good foundation um, specialized foundation program doctor um, and that generally I, I mean it's very basic but generally if you go through the book that is recommended here they provide a number of examples where you can start thinking about how you would answer those questions that might come up um, yeah for those of you messing I will um, I will send you the link um, so the possible questions that might come up, so I've listed them here, like I've said, why do you want to complete an SFP? Why this unit of application? What are your career goals? What is a clinical academic? And then situations might be, what is your biggest weakness? What difficulties do you envisage facing? So all the classics like difficulty time managing, working with supervisors, limited time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, difficult clinical scenarios and time management. You know, it's it's obvious stuff. Um, but my argument is that that structure in itself is better than having no structure and giving a really rambling answer. And I'll go through some um, something a bit later to tell you why that's important. But it but it isn't enough. And actually, what I want to focus on for the next 10, 15 minutes is how we go beyond just structuring our answers to making sure that our answers are very specific and efficiently communicate exactly why we are the best person for the job um and so this is this is an example of why camp doesn't necessarily work so for example why do you want to come to this foundation school so a bad answer would be this because it's incredibly generic but it's probably a structure that you could follow so i really like the rotations and it includes for example surgery and i want to do surgery long term it's a top ranked hospital which trainees really rate in gmc survey data Academically, a PG cert is going to allow me to develop and demonstrate the necessary skills to go on to develop my own career goals. Management-wise, it will give me the opportunity to manage my own research projects. And personal, I have family in this area and it's a nice area of the country to live in. That is better than giving a completely rambling answer all over the place, um, which would imply general lack of preparation. But it isn't enough because it's so generic and it isn't going to make you stand out. But if you get the structure in place initially, that is a good building block to take you to the next level. And believe me, when we do practice interviews, um, it is incredibly obvious that people who have done practice because they stru can structure their answers like this. And it is a hell of a lot better than the people that don't structure their answers at all and think they can wing it because they have a good CV. But th to take your sort of answers to the next level to give you a much better opportunity of securing the academic job you want, we're going to talk about that now. So the first thing to consider is that essentially in a consultant giving this advice, all interviews before you're a consultant are an exam. You might not know the mark scheme, but they are all an exam. And the mark scheme that they're going to be looking for is a person specification. So one of the things that to do after this talk is to go and have a look at the person specification for the specialized foundation program in some of them are released for certain deaneries. Um, Northwest used to be very transparent um, in previous years with what they wanted. But in general, there will be a person specification. If you can't find the one you want for your deanery, I would have a look at the academic clinical fellow one because it's obviously you do the specialized foundation program. And the idea is that it's a consistent pathway up to that type of level. And it's just trying to see how your achievements align with the person specification. And using that to show that you have an awareness of the role that you're going to need to fulfill. They want interviewers are looking that you are the most suitable person for the specific role they're interviewing for as an ideal candidate. And 
they want to know that you're the best fit for that location and for their organization as a candidate. And so you sort of need to sell yourself as firstly your sort of career as a medical student up to this point um, has, has led to an inevitable decision that you're going to apply to their deanery and that you are the ideal option for them based on what you have previously done. Um, and there is the there is a way of doing that that I'm going to go through now. So essentially, as I've said, you need to try and shoehorn in the work you have done previously to the five points I had on the previous slide. I think in general, less is more. So focus on the examples that align most. So, for example, they may want to know, like, sort of leadership of a research project, for example. Don't necessarily go for your most impressive publication, for example, in the unlikely event that you've got something published in Nature where you are the 18th author, that's going to sell less well than, say, the project that you built from a student-selected component that you had to work significantly with the supervisor on. Um, and how you went about doing that to make sure that you got to the end stage publication um, is going to be better than, for example, trying to shoehorn in a high impact factor publication. I'm going to go through this point of a three by three story next, but it's a way of building uh, this sort of structure in your mind of what have you done so far and where is it leading you to that you can sell to an interviewer. The other thing to think about when you're trying to sell yourself is about the specificities of the deanery. So what facilities and people are there and what have they done that links to what you have done previously? Um, and the really good way of doing that and what a, a sort of very impressive candidate did for my deanery last year is she contacted the academic um, unit of application, contacted the foundation school and went, can I be put in contact with an education AFP for, from your deanery to discuss what's required for the like in their job um, and the foundation school then got in contact with us as AFPs um, I then had quite a lot of discussions with her about what was required um, or what may be expected in the interview um, and then she ended up with a job and I have no doubt that that is because um, that that's because she was able to get a sort of inside track on um, the specificities of the role. Um, the other thing to ask about facilities and people is what, what facilities are unique to, to the deanery? Um, so for example, with my role as a Peninsular AFP, um, the specific things were that you were based at a hospital that had access to medical students from two different medical schools. Um, and that previously I, the unique selling point for me as an individual was that I had gone to a medical school in the deanery so was therefore aware of the sort of contextual elements of the curriculum and where I might be able to slot in in terms of education projects as an AFP so all that stuff can give you a little advantage um, and this this is the sort of answer that you can actually build and this is a sort of pretty accurate answer that I sort of gave in in my interviews so Essentially, what I did was I rearranged the camp structure to try and, and I'll go through this in a minute, to try and shoehorn in my sort of achievements that most aligned with the job role early. So you can see that I put the academic role above the clinical, but I said that I've been a medtoc academic sec at my university for two years, and I taught over 50 sessions to peers, as well as running a year-long syllabus for year one medical students. Um, and I basically wanted to formalise and advance my practice within clinical education. And the way to do that was going to be provided by the PG cert at the university um, and would also allow me to build on um, work on quantitative research I'd done during an MSc in clinical neuroscience during intercalation. So I very quickly, within two sentences there, or two or three sentences there, put in... Um, um, a lot of very high yield information that already attracts the interviewer's attention and is very specific to the things that I've done. Um, and then I've also put in the what's unique to me that means that I am a good fit for their specific deanery. Um, so I've also 
as I said, I'd shoehorned in that I was already aware of local undergraduate education systems, having already been a student there myself. Um, I've then gone on to clinical, and I think that's that's key. And I've said the fact you pick your own six month rotation, in which was the case in the Peninsula Deanery, is really attractive as it's going to allow me to focus on straight medicine. Um, because essentially I was teetering on the sort of between intensive care and neurology and wanted exposure to acutely unwell, um, managing acutely unwell patients with neurological illness. Um, and then at the end of that clinical bit, you can see that I've shoehorned in essentially the, I'm aware that although I'll be academic, it's still important I fulfill my academic competencies. So that's that box ticks from the person specification. And then on a personal point of view, again, it's just about selling what you need to sell. So, for example, I'm a rugby union match official. Um, my development is was based in Devon at the time. And also being from the southwest, I've got a lot of family and friends in the local area. So, again, it's that specificity, but also coming across as taking the box while doing that. And then summarize your answer at the end. So, and we'll talk about how to actually deliver what you, in terms of your speech, what you need to talk about. But um, just go over your key points at the end because the interviewers will lose focus. So this is from a talk that Nancy gave about four years ago now, but it's one of the best systems I've ever seen for preparing for an interview in general. And I'm still using this in preparation for core training interviews. So in terms of that camp structure, it's just you can create a three by three table over to try and basically align your achievements of what have you done clinically, academically, and personally, or why is it important to you over the past, present, and future in three domains that are important to you. So for example, for me, it's neurology or clinical neuroscience, medical education, and evidence-based medicine and decision-making. And then for each thing, you just go through what are examples that I've done in the past, so before my current sort of period of practice, what am I doing in, sort of in the present to try and sort of improve or work on this area? And then what, where would I like to go in the future? So in the next five years. Um, so for example, in neurology, I would just say, I've always been really interested in it at medical school clinically. At present, I have done a stroke job and it's really inspired me to do X, Y, and Z. In future, I would like to go on to be a neurology registrar. And if you can align, if you can use this structure and this sort of um, clinical academic personal for your sort of three personal themes, you will be able to co come up with a mental framework that means that you can confidently talk in an interview um, about that it might get brought up. So I think the other thing to talk about is how to say it in an interview. And I will um, I will just dwell on this briefly. There is a sort of 1% that you can apply to yourself in an interview that other people might not. And that's I hope that's one of the benefits coming to this talk. So the first thing to say is um, thinking about the technology that you have to hand, particularly you're delivering it online. So... Do you have a good webcam? If not, I would purchase one because poor quality webcam is going to not go in your favor and it's going to mean you're going to come across less well. Um, you can buy a halo light fairly cheaply online on Amazon and that will improve the lighting. Um, and again, that just goes in your favor in terms of making you seem present and more engaged and then having a microphone that works as well. Um, and again, you can buy those for about 20 quid off Amazon. Um, making sure that your internet connection is good. So I know it's difficult if you're in student accommodation, but it may be having a chat with your flatmates about trying to reduce bandwidth use. Um, and again, having a chat with any housemates or family members you live with about other noise and trying to reduce that. In terms of um, other things in communication, eye level and eye contact are really important. So one of the things I often work on with people that I have sort of taught how to do interviews is looking down on your camera like this, is really off-putting and quite ineffective. Whereas if you have it, if you have your camera at 90 meters to not 90 meters, that's ridiculous, but 90 centimeters to two meters away, 
and can raise the webcam so you're looking at it at eye level it comes across as much more natural and looks much more professional so can you stack a load of books under your micro um under your laptop the other thing is intonation so in general if you talk in a very monotone way about your achievements that comes across much less well than putting a lot of emphasis on the key words in what you're talking about so a little bit of what you need to focus on in your practice is the way that you deliver your answers and the other thing as well about having that camera 90 centimeters to two meters away which is sort of a distance roughly gauge on sort of social psychology data on sort of friendly interactions essentially is you'll be able to show broad body language so nice open body language plant hands sort of facing towards the camera potentially but not sort of all over the place obviously but nice open shoulders the other thing is room layout so obviously your room looking a mess behind you isn't isn't going to play very well so if possible try and have a completely blank background just so any subconscious bias from the interviewers um doesn't doesn't come into play um so i would encourage just having a plain background if possible and then also i put intonation again it was definitely a mistake, but I would say it's probably your most important thing is trying to come across as if you're giving a sort of engaging talk rather than um, giving it in a very monotone way. And that will improve if you are well practiced in your answers. Um, I think the, the most important point that I, I can put across to you is good communication can be practiced. And if you look up this talk on YouTube, the 110 techniques communication um, that's about the sort of non-verbal elements of communication. Um, you can try and employ some of them. Um, there's loads of stuff on YouTube on communication, obviously, um, but I genuinely think this talk is really helpful and it certainly helped me with my public speaking um, as well. Um, and I can't iterate enough how much um, better you will come across in a personal station. You can have the best CV in the world, but if you do not sell yourself in terms of your non-verbals, you are going to have done yourself a significant disfavor um, compared to someone who absolutely nails it on trying to be engaging in the interview. Um, and I think it really comes back to this. So I actually can't find the original paper for this, but having done enough sort of medical student undergraduate interviews and sort of um, mock interviews for SFP stuff myself, um, I cannot disagree with this any less. So in general, when you're going into a sort of interview, at the beginning, the interviewer is going to be listening with your with their full attention. And after about 10 seconds, the intensity already starts to drop off. At 60 seconds, it's really difficult to maintain focus, especially if you've been doing interviews all day. So again, get those high yield points early. And you can do that by thinking about how what you've done previously aligned with the sort of mark scheme or person specification that they're going to be looking for. Um, and by the time you get to 90 seconds, it's really difficult to continue focusing. Um, so you can refocus them by summarizing, but certainly keep your answers to definitely less than two minutes, but try and keep them to 90 seconds. Um, that's taken from monster.com, which is a job interview thing. I tried to find the original paper it's based on. Um, I'm aware that it's pretty well versed in most communication sort of literature. Um, but in general, um, if you can keep your answers to under 90 seconds with your most high yield point in the first 10 seconds, you will do much better than people who are A, unstructured, but B, don't think about this side of things. So I think how to get good at it is this sort of process of both deliberate and consistent practice. So if you if it is possible, work with someone who knows nothing about the job on your delivery, because if they're not focused on the sort of content elements, they will be able to tell you whether what you were talking about was engaging or whether they were drifting off. Um, in terms of your content, go through it with someone who has done SFP or who's certainly done SFP interviews and received feedback, and they should be able to work with you on receiving correct feedback. And I think it's important. I think as medics, we're particularly bad at this, and especially people that are going to do academic foundation programs, except that you're going to be terrible at some elements of interviewing. And the only way you're going to get better is by practicing and taking on board that feedback and going, OK, what was I doing wrong or what went wrong? And then thinking about, OK, in terms of what directly went wrong, how can I get better? Um, and if you can employ that, 
rather than just doing the same thing again and again, hoping to get better through just practicing blindly again and again, you will improve rapidly. I think the other thing is consistency. So set very regular meetings and objectives for your meetings um, with a group of people who you trust or who more importantly are going to keep you accountable. Um, so I know someone said they were doing once weekly meetings um, with a group of medics. That's great. So just say, you know, this week I want to focus on what sort of three answers for three very common questions. Um, and if we can get through that, that would be great. And then set yourself targets and re-review regularly. So like I've said, doing a certain amount of questions per session and reviewing sort of two weeks, for example. Um, and if you can employ this, that's how you get good at any skill. It's not just interviewing, but like I said, think of the interview as and your communication, particularly your number stuff as a skill. Um, and like anything, you can practice at it, but more more likely than not, you're going to be rubbish at some element of it initially, just because you haven't had to do an interview for six years. Um, and that's inevitable. But if you accept that, you're likely to do much better. Please let us know your feedback. This is the feedback link for the whole session. So um, I'm sure Andrew's uh, section will be uh, far superior to this. But if you want to give me some initial feedback, that would be brilliant. Um, and yeah. That's it for me. Do we have any questions? Can you hear me? Sorry. Yes. yes. Good, good. Uh, I was just wondering for this, um, I know the title of this uh, section is personal, but I was just wondering, does this relate to a specific um, interview or like a set, one of the two interviews that they do where the things are clinical and personal? Because I just don't know, because I'm applying for the two deaneries I'm applying for don't have a personal section and not saying it's not useful, but um is the style and all the, everything you've discussed with, with respect to camp and star specific to the personal subset of the interview or yeah uh i would say um it is highly likely to come up in any inter i would be amazed if they don't ask you in any sfp interview why do you want to come here yeah um, no sorry i'm not wasn't saying that it wasn't relevant i was just asking no, no, no. Um, yeah I'm just, I'm just trying to think um I think generally camp and star, like I said, it's about anything around your motivation for camp or star, certainly in an interview, you may get asked, for example, um, like, ha have you had to deal with a clinical situation like this in the past? Um, or can you tell us about X generic skill that you have? Um, and that's still very helpful for that. Um, so, for example, tell us about a difficult clinical situation or... Um, Tell us about your leadership or time management skills that would still require star. Um, and I think going through that book that I recommended uh, does very much come up with um, sort of those sorts of questions. So I'd still recommend thinking about, like I said, in that sort of framework structure, your most high yield situations before you go into sort of an interview and applying a star structure to that when you prep it. Is that all right? Does that sort of answer the question? Yeah, that's brilliant. That is brilliant. Thank you. Just, just to jump in as well, I so um I I did my SFP um at Oxford and yeah, so they do what's called an academic station and then they do a clinical station. So the clinical station is just that. It was it was very much um just clinical. The academic side, they ask you, I mean, you know, I, I assume it's gonna be similar if other deaneries do this, but they ask would ask you general kind of academic type questions, but the, the key is to utilize those questions to also get across all of your personal attributes that you have. So they might ask you, uh, you know, a very academic type question, but there's an opportunity for you to go in with, well, I have this experience, this is how I understand this, and kind of answer the point, and then also extend how your experiences and the experience of the SFP is then going to, you know, benefit you, how you can contribute to the, the unit and, and what how that aligns for the future so wherever possible if if the question is appropriate you should be trying to introduce all these aspects of your your personal situation um, i know colleagues that did interviews at other places um, who weren't necessarily as successful had similar type of questions but answered the question very directly and didn't introduce all the things that they'd achieved if that makes sense see we've got a couple of other questions and a very nice bit of feedback um 
How many questions will they usually ask in the section? Any advice for the personal aspect of camp if applying to a deanery where you are not from or don't have family? So um, certainly in my interview, I got asked sort of two or three very direct personal questions before we did a clinical clinical station. I would say generally going, I mean, generally preparing for this stuff is going to be helpful anyway for core training interviews. And there will probably be a similar number of questions and time allotted in the core training interview anyway. Um, but I would say it would be 10 to 15 minutes of maybe three to five questions uh, as my knowledge of deanery. So it's worth investing in anyway, because like Luke has said, it may be that you get a question that actually is a bit left field in an academic station um, that they actually might be wanting to know about a personal attribute in terms of um, sort of you may be able to bring in stuff from like a personal hobby. So, for example, with me, with the sort of rugby refereeing, um, like that obviously comes with a lot of leadership and sort of advanced communication stuff that they may want to know about in a sort of managing a research project type situation. Um, so it is still worth preparing, even if you only get one question. Um, any advice for the personal aspect of camp if applying to a junior where you are not from or don't have family? Um, like I say, that's where that's where contacting someone who has already worked in the deanery might come in helpful because there might be that sort of what's known as in negotiation as a black swan bit of information that you actually can apply um, to to yourself uh, even if it is a hobby and you're like oh there is actually a local club of this very niche hobby that I do that's in the local area um, that I know of and that even even if the interviews are like that's a bit weird that still sort of sticks makes you stick in their minds and ultimately is a bit of a game in that respect as well I don't know if you've got anything else to add on that Luke at all no yeah I, I think that's a good comment you know just you can use that personal section as a as a good way to drop in some hobby that you do that you know makes you stand out like I think I said that I play lacrosse and it's a good excuse that I can go hit people because I can't do yeah. it at work or something like that it was like really stupid but they obviously <laughs> enjoyed it <laughs> um cool and then we got when contact with someone who's done SFP in the deanery you're interested what sort of questions do you think is important to ask um I think to, to be honest I think but most foundation doctors just appreciate being being asked for their opinion on anything in general um because it makes made us feel quite made me feel quite sort of important and like I was doing something good for once um I think uh, in general it's just it's like I said it's just you know I think it's um can you tell me a little bit about what your job has been like in the deanery especially like Peninsula was a complete blank slate in terms of what we um were allowed to do as education AFPs when I was there so um it it was just like a I think when I had a chat with Anjali who, who contacted me it was just sort of this is what I've done um this is what you could consider doing and talking about in your interview and that was really helpful for her in terms of aligning um what she wanted to do in terms of her long-term interests with potential education projects but I think it's having a chat about what what the scope of a potential project is in terms of the facilities that may be the insider knowledge someone in the deanery has especially in terms of research it's like well how difficult is it to get a sort of lab-based project are you having to plan it all from the beginning yourself or is there going to be a sort of oven baked project that's provided by lab that you're going to provide help with um Luke I don't know if you've got more insight into that having done a research one um I would say um just in terms of approaching um people that are doing AFPs it, you'll find a bit of a range of, of people and there's different routes to do it I mean you can reach out to people directly find them on LinkedIn um I know uh, a few of my friends have been found from LinkedIn by people or you can try messaging the deanery directly that might be a bit more cumbersome to get through because it relies on email chains um I think just a general rule with life and approaching mentors or anything kind of go in with a, a semi-specific question like oh you know can I talk to you two minute for two minutes about your experience in doing this AFP because I, I might be interested in doing it won't take too much time and then that's less intimidating as a person who generally might be quite busy um, to take that time to talk to you and then you'll probably find that they then give you lots of advice but if you if you just go and say oh can you tell me about how I get into this AFP 
like we're running a whole course on it like it's not that quick to explain so um if you're trying to find like a mentor or someone to get some information come up with a you know a specific question about that place that you want to actually find out and then things will probably snowball from there so try not to overthink it too much um i think another good thing you can do is also um start looking at uh, potential um people that you can do work with like supervisors and stuff um they're often quite happy to have you know 20 minute 30 minute meeting sit down with you they may well have had um sfp academics and, and stuff come through before as well so they might have some insight andrew are you ready yep uh let me just share my screen beautiful so just while andrew um gets up and running um so he's going to be talking to you today uh, about the clinical station of the um sfp interview this uh, will take up quite a large chunk of your marks and things, so it's very important. Um, don't don't underestimate it. The um, the bar is quite high in terms of performance in this station, so hopefully we can give you lots of tips on how to perform and how to go and study. And um, yeah, also it's going to be helpful for your, your med school finals as well. It's a lot of crossover. So anyway, I will pass you over to Andrew. Thank you. Nice. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Andrew. I'm uh, currently, I've just started core surgical training, um, and I'll be talking about the uh, clinical uh, station of the SFP interview. So just uh, just to start with the disclaimer, this uh, the contents of this webinar and everything I'll be talking about is going to be based on my experience and of the colleagues I've spoken to, and it's not endorsed by any university of, or any deanery in particular. So this is what we're going to be covering today. And just a bit about me. So I graduated in 2021. I intercalated um, uh, with a BSc in bioengineering during that time. Um, I did my AFP in Oxford for the past two years. I've just finished it. And um, right now I'm doing a CST in London. Um, so, And I'm also acting as the Access the SFP treasurer for the next year. So uh, some of my F1 and F2 rotations of my AFP is down below. So I did dermatology, acute medicine, and geriatrics. Did some orthogeriatrics, did some GP, A&E, and then I finished on my academic block. So um, just to briefly touch upon the um, the interview structure, um, I appreciate that Alex has um, gone through this in quite a bit of detail, but just a small thing from me. So... I think around, I think my year was the first year to start doing virtual interviews um, for the SFP. In the past, it was always just phys physical interviews from my understanding. Um, and it looks like they'll be uh, going this way for the foreseeable future. So it's going to be either Zoom or Microsoft Teams meeting more than likely. And it's going to uh, have either two or three stations um, for most uh, for most deaneries and for most posts so you'll definitely get a clinical station you'll definitely get an academic station and the personal station may um may be its own station or it may be part of the academic station as we were talking about earlier um so this is so this structure is mainly for the research posts because the um so the medical education ones and the leadership ones might have uh, some slightly different formats but all in all, it should be following this um, this structure for the most part. And just to briefly talk about how I prepped for the clinical interview. So I um, appreciate it's still quite, for some people, it's quite a way, uh, long way away from finals, but um, it's quite useful to use this as a sort of a way to kickstart your finals revision. Um, and so... All of this information, everything that you learned during this, uh, during during prepping for the clinical interview, is going to be directly applicable for you in your final OSCEs and even being an F1, which is you know, the whole point why they they have these clinical interviews. Um, the main the main resource that everyone uses and should really be sort of the baseline uh, knowledge for everyone is using the Oxford Handbook for Clinical Medicine. Um, and in particular, the emergency section. So everything in that section at the end of the book is gold dust. Um, everything is directly relevant. Um, you should uh, try to try to read through everything and go through it a few times and 
practice you know going through the scenarios um, in in that emergency section with your friends other things that i used were sort of um, older year notes so previous sfps that have come through from my university or the, in the deanery that i've wanted to go to i i got in contact with them asked them if they've made any notes um, uh, and i used that quite a bit um, other generic things that you can use for both finals and for the clinical interviews would be uh, question banks like past med and past test um, I found the zero to finals podcast quite useful, especially because um, you get it in sort of a verbal format. And so you can sort of uh, try to uh, speak along with them and just um, double check your knowledge and, you know, get used to verbalizing your thoughts, uh, which would be very useful for interview practice. Um, I used Radiopedia and some flashcard apps as well. Um, and the last thing to talk about is uh, the courses that I've I went to for uh, to prep for the the SFP. So most of the time, um, you be able to get um, get on these courses for free because they they run just like ours. Um, but there will be some courses which um, well, you know, will be uh, will be paid courses. And I went for a few of those. And in hindsight, I think they didn't necessarily teach me anything that wasn't already freely available they were useful for you know just to build my confidence but for the most part you can probably get away with just free courses like ours and this next part so oh, this next part um so it's quite important to think about why exactly they've um they've put in a clinical station in an in an academic um in an academic uh job um, interview and the reason why they do that is because in f1 and f2 this is when you really um you really become you know you start to become a doctor you think like a doctor because everything that you learn in medical school um it's just theory and sort of putting that into practice with the day-to-day uh, -day life is quite can be quite challenging and so this, the learning curve is extremely steep in f1 and f2 um and by nature of you of having an academic rotation you will have one less block than everyone else than all your other colleagues so you'll have four months less experience which at such an early point in your career is actually quite a big uh, big chunk of it and so they're trying to select for people who are already sort of at a good baseline who are already um, at the time quite uh, they're quite good they are uh, their clinical acumen is quite um, quite sound um, just because the whole point of the foundation program whether it be an academic post or just a generic um, AF, a generic foundation program is to produce safe and uh, safe doctors. And so with that in mind, the key things to think about is that you want to try and demonstrate your knowledge to your to your interviewer, show that you not you know more than just the bare minimum and you can apply that knowledge in an interview scenario and especially in an emergency scenario and also they want to try and select for safe f1 so when you're structuring your answer you want to think about how can i demonstrate that i am a safe f1 uh, we'll be talking more about this um, during this talk but for the most part it's going to be sort of having an awareness of your limitations especially uh, when you have an unwell patient you want to escalate to your senior quite quickly you need to be aware of your blind spots and your uh, and your lack of experience um, so that you can um, safely um, keep, keep your patients safe and get senior help quite early. And just in general, approaching the clinical station, like I said, you need to think about what the role of the F1 is. So you're going to be the first medical point of contact for the nurses, uh, HCAs on the ward. Uh, if they're ever concerned about a patient clinically, they'll be contacting you. And so your job is to first of all gather information so that will be in the form of you know look, looking through the notes synthesizing the information gathering it all together and also assessing the patient and sort of trying to um, get put it all together and you they also expect you to initiate basic treatment uh, most of the time this will be uh, the initial life-saving treatment and then you want and then they want you to alert someone more senior so that you get a second pair of eyes, someone more experienced, um, again, just to uh, cover those blind spots that I was just talking about. 
Um, so for the clinical station and with all interview stations, really, you want to be extremely systematic. You want to have a structure in your head that you can always hang your hat off um, so that if you ever get lost, you can go back to the structure that you have in your head. Um, and so you won't just be put on the spot and sort of have nothing to say. So the for the clinical station, the structure that you'll be using um, will um, that's recommended by almost everyone will be the sort of A2E format. So um, this is used in ALS, uh, this is used in ATLS, and it's just a very good structure that um, you know, is tried and tested, um, and there's very good reasoning behind it. So uh, for those who don't uh, know, A2E, um, uh, the A2E structure goes through uh, assessing the patient's airway, assessing the patient's breathing, then assessing circulation, disability, and exposure. Um, then the next point is to sort of make um, is to make statements during your interviews, uh, like this patient, you know, is acutely unwell. I'm very worried about him, so I'm going to see him first, and I'm going to um, assess him and initiate treatment based on a, a systematic A to E approach. And so that will. Uh, let your exam, let your interviewer know that you've got, you know, good, clear structure in your mind, that you're able to recognize an unwell patient, and that you uh, you will likely have the confidence to go through all that. And this is not your first time even thinking about it. Some other tips: if you ask for an investigation during the during the interview, you need to be ready to interpret it, and you need to be able to justify it to the examiner. So this is to stop you from asking for a whole barrage of blood tests and um, imaging requests. So you need to think about what you need there and then and what is sort of what can come later. Um, a useful tip to is to know the common drug doses um, related to all your um, all the uh, emergencies, emergency scenarios that you'll get. So um, the Oxford Handbook of Clinical um, for Clinical Medicine is actually very good for this. Um, in the emergency section, they lay out all the all the emergency uh, drug doses quite well. Um, and if not, if things aren't covered there, you can always check the BNF um, before your interview. And it's worth knowing uh, some antibiotic doses as well. Um, and this will make more sense later, but during your during your clinical stations, you always want to be reassessing your patients. So once you once you've assessed the airway and you you uh, perform an intervention, you need to reassess the airway. Once you've done uh, once you've assessed your breathing and did something regarding the breathing, you want to reassess. And sometimes it's uh, even though you're halfway through your A to B, let's say you get up to C, it's always worth thinking about: Do I need to reassess from from A again? Just because uh, sometimes things can change, and if you don't think about it, if you don't think about reassessing, you might miss something that's uh, changed since you last um, since you last assessed the airway. Um, some other tips about the for the clinical station: you want to um, show that you have actually been into placements during your medical school. You want to show that you are aware of the available resources on the ward that are uh, that you can use to sort of assess this patient. So most of the time you want to think about who uh, who else can help you. So on the ward, you'll always have nurses and HCAs who can help you, you know, take bloods, they can put in cannulas, they can get the observations. So it's always worth thinking about who's physically present. Um, maybe, you're, maybe that your senior is there physically as well, but in the interview scenario, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> um, other tips, you need to know when to escalate as an F1, and most of the time this will be after you've done your initial A2E assessment and resuscitation. So almost certainly you want to es escalate at the earliest point, um, which will be again at the end of your A2E. You need to learn how to prioritize patients. We'll be going through that in a bit. Um, and um, in, because as an F1, you'll be bombarded with jobs left, right, and center. You'll have so many things. You'll be juggling so many plates. Uh, but you need to have a clear structure, have a clear rationale of what you need to prioritize and why. And the last two tips that I have is related to what we were talking about earlier, trying to impress your interviewers because they're trying to look for, um, for people who are already quite clinically 
good and have a good knowledge base because then it will be easier it'll be more likely that you'll finish f2 sort of at the level of an f2 that that's expected or exceed that expectation so you need to try and think about um try and uh, thinking about sprinkling sprinkling in some knowledge uh from from things that you've learned in med school uh, things that you learned, you've read in a book or any recent studies that have come out which may uh, which will be relevant to your situation um, uh, that you're given in your clinical scenario because then they will be they will get impressed so with most clinical scenarios um, what they will do is they'll give you about three cases um, and so I I interviewed at both uh, London and Oxford and London definitely gave you three or four cases where they each have different different levels of priority. And the way that you can sort of pick apart which ones are more important is to use a systematic approach. So again, using the A2E approach is very useful because, uh, you know, the reason why, like, uh, for example, ATLS uses the A2E approach. Um, a2e system is because an airway problem is going to kill someone faster than a breathing problem and a breathing problem is going to kill someone faster than a circulation problem and so that uh, the natural sort of um, continuation of that logic is that you need to prioritize patients who you deem to have an airway problem um, and that takes precedence over anyone with a breathing problem takes precedence over a circulation problem of course sometimes um, you don't necessarily have to stick to this you know um, super strictly, but most of the time, if you apply this, you'll likely um, be able to justify it. Um, and with these prioritization cases, if it's not obvious, you know whether or not um, whether or not which, uh, which one needs to go first, second, or third, then you can always um, ask the ask the interviewer for a bit more of a bit for more information because that's exactly what you do in real life. Um, so asking about the OBS, asking about um, the trend of the OBS and what the patients like um, at the end of the bed uh, is very useful to try and uh, triage these uh, scenarios. Um, it's important to realize, like I said earlier, there is not necessarily going to be a right answer all the time. Uh, and sometimes they will give you um, sort of a um, couple of scenarios that sort of they are quite closely uh, related in terms of their priority and they will not be expecting um, a right answer but they will want to want you to, to think to uh, verbalize your thought process and justify why you think patient a is more important than patient b uh, so don't don't get thrown off by that um, another thing to think about is um, sometimes some scenarios some presentations may not um, uh, have an obvious um, not you know, for um, may not have uh, how to, how should I put it may not have an obvious um, the initial problem may not be the only problem. So if, um, I think this example upper GI bleeding is quite it, uh, illustrates this point quite clearly. So with an upper GI bleed, yes, their blood pressure is going to be low. They're going to be tachycardic. They are losing lots of blood, but there also can be an airway problem when they start to, um, when they vomit out blood and they start aspirating the blood, they may start obstructing the airway, which will um, go from a circulation problem to an airway problem. And so that would be, would ju you would be justified in wanting to see this patient quite urgently. Um, and lastly, uh, one point to think about is, like I said earlier, they're looking for safe F1s. And so you want to uh, sort of start your start your spiel, really, with saying that patient safety is your number one priority. Therefore, I need to prioritize these patients based on clinical urgency. And based on my assessment, patient A needs to be seen first because he has an airway problem. So you need to be able to have a spiel like that and always link it back to patient safety. So this is an example of some cases that you may get. We'll be going through these cases later on. So number one, 50-year-old male presenting with three days of fever, shortness of breath, and a productive cough. Uh, his OBS are as follows. Um, the only thing of note is that he's got, a, he's got saturations of 89% on room air. 
second one is a eight-year-old lady on the ward uh, presenting now with cyanosis and noisy, noisy breathing after um, having some uh, being started on some antibiotics for a catheter-associated UTI. Uh, her OBS aren't great. She's got a heart rate of 120, respiratory rate of 24, uh, blood pressure 85 over 60, saturations 88 or, uh, 88% on room air. And third scenario that you can be given, 85-year-old male, he's been medically fit for discharge for the last five days, uh, waiting for social setup. And his daughter wants to speak to you, the doctor, quite urgently, as they are, the daughter is upset that he's been languishing in hospital for the last five days. Um, so we'll come back to these cases um, later on, uh, thinking about which ones to prioritize and which ones can wait. And so with the with the clinical station, uh, you'll be given those three cases, then you'll have about maybe about 30 seconds to think about which one you want to see first, and then you need to start talking to the examiner about uh, what you're going to do. So um, for all patients, uh, you, first of all, you want to justify why you why you want to see them. And then after that, you want to um, sort of gather more information whilst you're still on the phone with the nurse. So you can ask them to sort of do an extra set of OBS. You want to, some important inf information to get is sort of where the patient is, uh, what their hospital number is, and uh, where are they physically located in the hospital because you need to sort of get there. Um, you can ask nurse to do some things before you get there and this shows that this shows the, the interviewer that you're a uh, you're a proactive everyone you are thinking about what can be done in a timely fashion and how to make things go more efficiently so you can ask the nurse to go gather the notes uh, for the patient get the drop chart get the fluid charts have everything ready for you when you get there um, you can also think about asking them to uh, take some blood, put in some put in a cannula, uh, but this will depend on the skill set of the the nursing team in on the ward and their workload. And of course, once you're seeing your main patient that you're worried about, uh, you will need to you can't just ignore your other two patients. You need to tell uh, tell whoever's on the phone um, that you will have to see a different patient because there is a clinical urgency for that, uh, but. You should get them. You want to keep those patients safe as well. So ask them to do regular OBS every fifteen minutes, half an hour, and contact you or your senior if they deteriorate, or they can put out a peri arrest or an arrest call if needed. So going through the A three structure. So the first thing to do is the airway. So you want to. The whole point of this part is to assess the airway patency, and so. The easiest thing to do um, is to check if the patient can verbalize. So what I would do is say that, um, so I want to, so I'm going to uh, introduce to my patient, see if they can, if they, they can speak to me. So if they are speaking to you, that's, you can quite confidently say that uh, the airway is intact. Uh, but for, if there's a reason, for whatever reason, they are not able to uh, verbalize, then you need to sort of start assessing it using a look, listen, feel approach. So look, listen, feel is quite useful when you're assessing airway and breathing. So this is a good structure to use. So you want to uh, look inside the patient's mouth, looking for, uh, you want to see if there's any secretions, any vomitus, uh, any bleeding, any foreign bodies in there. Um, you want to listen for any, uh, any inspiratory effort, um, from the patient. You also want to try and feel for uh, their breath. And so you can see on this in this picture, this chap here is assessing uh, the, the child using a look, listen, feel approach quite um, all simultaneously. So he's looking um, at the chest as well, looking for if there's any inspiratory effort, he's listening for breath sounds, um, and he's sort of feeling the chest for any expansion. And when you're going through your A2E, as a general rule, once you've identified an issue, you should do something about it immediately. Um, and so in the airway, if you hear, if you hear noisy breathing, um, you can start doing some airway maneuvers. If you see sort of vomitus or uh, vomitus in the, in the oral cavity, you can sort of suction it up or get nurse to suction it up. If you see foreign bodies, you can get some, get some forceps to try and remove it. So, and a good rule of thumb is you want to do, you want to start with the least invasive procedure um, to remedy whatever problem that you've come across. Uh, and then you want to escalate that um, as appropriate if it doesn't work. 
So for airways, the most common things that you'll uh, come across is that you'll need to start doing some airway maneuvers, try and open up the airways, uh, making sure that the patient's able to have a clear airway so that they can breathe really. So the easiest, uh, the things to do, you need to be aware of a head tilt chin lift and you need to be able to uh, do a jaw thrust as well. As well. So uh, once you've done this, you need to reassess the patient. So once you've done the head tilt chin lift, have another, have another look, listen, feel, see if that's solved the problem. If not, then you need to think about putting in some airway adjuncts. So uh, the two most common airway adjuncts, a nasopharyngeal and an oropharyngeal airway, you need to be quite comfortable with them, um, knowing the different indications and importantly, the, the contraindications of them. You also need to know how to, uh, how to size them up for the individual patient and how to put them into either the mouth or the nose. Other things you can do is to use a laryngeal mask airway. Uh, so this is commonly referred to as an eye gel. Um, and if all of that still doesn't work, you and they still have an airway issue, or if they were obstructed from the start with no, with no uh, sort of, with no chance of any of these working, is so that you need to consider escalating um, this patient for an intubation. So this most of the time this will be sort of bleeping eye to you, bleeping your your medical registrar, um, who can help and they can help you with that. Um, and so one other thing to say is that in general, a good rule of thumb is that if the patient is um, got GCS of less than eight, then you need to consider intubation because then they're unable to protect their airway. So like I said previously, we need to always reassess um, the patient whenever we do something or if it's been a few, you know, a certain amount of time, it's always worth going back and reassessing. Um, if no improvement, you, you can put up a peri-arrest call, get ITU down, they can help you with the airway, they're the airway experts after all. Um, other things within the airway part of A2E is if you hear stridor, um, you need to think about upper airway obstruction. So uh, most importantly, anaphylaxis, because it's so time critical, you need to always have that at the back of your mind. So if you do think it's anaphylaxis, some things that you can do is to remove whatever precipitant there is that may be causing the anaphylaxis, give them some adrenaline, um, and then continue reassessing. Then going on to assessing their breathing. So again, a very good structure for this that you can use is a look, listen, feel approach. So you want to look at the patient's chest wall, look at whether they have any, they're making any respiratory effort, and if they're in any respiratory distress, you want to look centrally and peripherally if they have uh, signs of cyanosis. Um, and then you want to listen to their chest. You want to auscultate them front and back if possible. You want to listen for any added sounds. You want to uh, listen for wheeze, crackles, and making sure that there is adequate air entry throughout. Uh, then next, you want to have a feel of the chest, making sure that there is a symmetrical chest expansion. You want to feel for the tracheal position, and it's always worth percussing these patients on their chest. Then next thing you want to do is to think about getting their observations. So um, even though you've had some observations, you know, at the handover when the nurse was initially um, presenting this to you, you want to get an up-to-date um, set of observations most of the time. If you have a, a nurse that can help you or an HCA, they can uh, do that. So being able to delegate your tasks is very important as an F1. So you want to get your uh, get the patient's respiratory rate and your oxygen saturations. And at this point, you can think about getting further investigations as well. So if required, you can do an ABG uh, and you can think about getting an X-ray as well. But more than likely, an X-ray is going to take some time and you won't have uh, you won't have the luxury of time to wait for the, the results to come back for that. And again, once, you, once you've identified any issues, you want to correct those abnormalities as soon as possible. So most of the time in breathing, in these uh, critically unwell patients, they will have low oxygen saturations. Easiest thing to do um, once you've made sure that they have, a, they have an airway um, secured in the previous step is to whack them on 15 liters of oxygen via non-rebreather mask, aiming for saturations of 94 to 98%, unless they are a proven CO2 retainer. Um, in that case, you aim for slightly lower. Um, and the reason for this is because you don't want to uh, give them too much oxygen uh, because they're quite used to 
So when these CO2 retainers um, are out in the community, they're, they're used to having a lower um, oxygen saturation level. And the classic thinking is that they, um, they now have a hypoxic drive causing them to breathe. Um, and that if you give them too much oxygen, you might remove that hypoxic drive. And so then they will uh, have a reduced respiratory rate. They'll go into type two respiratory failure, uh, which will uh, make things much worse. But it's important to, to know that in an acutely unwell, in an acute situation, if you're not sure if the patient with COPD is actually a carb, uh, carbon dioxide retainer, it's much better to put them on the, put them on high flow oxygen, correct the hypoxia because hypoxia will kill them faster than, um, than an increased uh, CO2 concentration in their blood. Um, other things that you can do in the breathing section of, um, of the A2E. So if you hear a wheeze, you need to remedy that immediately so you can give them uh, some nebulized salbutamol. Um, if they if they have got a reduced respiratory rate, to got pinpoint pupils to go uh, with that, then you have to think about opiate toxicity and you want to give them the, uh, the antidote quite soon. Um, other things that might pop up during the, uh, the breathing section is that they may get uh, these patients if they have signs of attention pneumothorax. So if they've got a deviated trachea, they don't have air entry on one side and they've got hyper resonance to percussion. Uh, then you need to think about attention pneumothorax. That's very, very time critical. And so you need to immediately do a needle decompression. So this will be uh, sort of a needle through the fifth intercostal space on the mid axillary line. And again, once you've done anything for your patient, you need to reassess them. So once you've put them on the put them on oxygen, just say to the interviewer, and I'd like to I'd like to get an up-to-date oxygen saturations to make sure that my intervention, my intervention has worked. And then moving on to circulation. So for circulation, the whole idea is to, to check whether they've got central and peripheral perfusion. So you can check their cap refill time. You can do observations to them, their heart rate, blood pressure. You want to listen to uh, listen to their, uh, their heart sounds. Um, and you also want to get a 12 lead ECG for almost all patients, just, uh, just as a precaution. And if you think it's required, if they're um, if they're tachycardic, if they've got chest pain, always worth putting them on a cardiac monitor. And as part of circulation, you want to get um, IV access for these uh, patients. Most of the time, because they're going to be quite unwell, you want to get the best access you can. So this will usually be in the form of two large bowl cannulae um, in, sort of, in quite big veins. So you want to aim for the antecubital fossa at least. Um, here you can think about getting input-output monitoring for their um, for fluid balance, and because you have you have, you've put in a cannula, you can you can start taking blood. So this will really depend on the scenario. Um, so don't just rattle off a generic set of bloods because they may not all be relevant, but just have a think about what would be useful for this patient right now. And here it ties in to the sepsis six, because then you can start thinking about blood cultures and doing the rest of the sepsis six, uh, if, you're if you're suspecting them to have a severe infection. Um, some other some other things you can do in terms of management. So usually lots of these patients, when they're unwell, they will be hypotensive, they will be shocked. Um, and so you want to try and correct that aim. For, you want to aim for a good blood pressure. So you want to start giving them some fluid boluses the amount of it will depend on their age and whether or not they've got any um, heart disease. So usually most patients can tolerate 500 mils, especially if they're in shock. Um, but if they have severe heart failure, for example, then it's worth thinking about sort of smaller um, boluses like 250. Um, and the thing to note with these IV fluid boluses is that you should always um, give them a bolus Reassess if the blood pressure is still not where you want it to be. You can always give them more boluses. Um, usually, you can give up to about two mils, uh, two liters, before thinking of uh, having to do other things. Um, in your circulation uh, part, you can also think about uh, giving them blood transfusions if their hemoglobin is very low, if they are, uh, if they're losing lots of blood in an upper GI bleed. Think about uh, group and safe cross matching these patients. 
Um, and if they've got, and last thing to think about is if they need rate control, if they if they've got tachycardia, um, for whatever reason, uh, other than just a physiological response, if they've got supraventricular tachycardia, you need to think about uh, rate and rhythm control for these patients. And again, you always want to reassess these patients um, every time you've done an intervention. And usually at this point in circulation, it's always worth just briefly saying to the examiner, I'd like to go back uh, to reassess the airway and breathing just to make sure that they're still, um, they're, they're still holding up well, whether they're maintaining the airway and whether the oxygen saturations are still fine. Then moving on to assessing their disability, you always want to check glucose in this uh, in this part. Um, it's relevant for patients who may have um, hyper or hypoglycemia. And so if they are hyperglycemia, you want to think about DKA or think about um, HHS for patients with pre-existing type 2 diabetes. Other things that you want to consider in this, in this section, um, having a look at their pupils, so shining a light into their eyes. Um, you want to make sure that their pupils are equal and reactive to light. Um, and just want to, just a special point to note is to see if they have pinpoint pupils, because that will be a sign of um, opiate toxicity, in which case you will need to give them the antidote. Um, and here you can briefly, you can briefly uh, assess their GCS, or if you don't have time, you can do an AVPU, because um, ties back to what we were saying earlier, if they've got a very low GCS, uh, then you want to think about whether or not they'll need uh, a definitive airway if they can't protect their own. And you can also do a brief neuro exam here. And then moving on to uh, the last part of A2E, the exposure. So you want to expose the patient from top to toe, making sure that they are uh, they, they keep warm throughout. So you want to have a look at all parts of your skin as much as possible. You want to look underneath the bed sheets, looking for anything that you may miss. Um, you're looking for rashes, any wounds, having a feel of the calves. You can also do an apto exam here, and it's worth getting the temperature at this point if you haven't got it already. And then once you've come out of your A2E, um, the idea is that you've by doing the A2E, you've uh, essentially stabilized the patient, um, and so that you'll have slightly more, you have a little bit more breathing room uh, to get a better idea of what's going on, why the patient is so unwell. And so, what you want to do is take a brief uh, history, and a good acronym to use is AMPLE. So, checking the patient's allergies, medications, past medical history, when their last meal was, and what the events leading up to the present situation was. Um, then after that, once you've done that, you want to go have a read of notes, see what the patient's in for originally, see what their trajectory has been, see what their ops have been doing, um, so that you have a clear idea of why the patient is in their current state. Uh, and this will be very useful when you start, when you discuss with your senior uh, to get more advice, because they'll need to get a clear picture to give you, um, give you good advice. Um, then after that, you want to write in the notes what you've done so that other healthcare professionals are aware. Make sure that you tell the nurse and give them an update on what the plan is going forward. So this could be regular ops. It could be um, having a, a, a review by the registrar or the SHO afterwards. Okay. So that's, the, that's essentially the main part of the clinical uh, station. So going through... Um, your prioritization, going through your patient, picking out the important points, um, trying to trying to uh, remedy anything that you can there and then, and just getting advice from your senior, making sure that you give them a clear handover and be clear that you're looking for advice for this patient who's quite unwell. And at the end of at the end of all of that, the examiner may ask you a few different questions. Uh, they may try to test your knowledge. It's not uncommon. I remember in Oxford, my Oxford interview, what they did was at the end uh, was to, they, I think I had a DKA patient and they asked me about what do you know about uh, DKA? So I had to briefly talk about the pathophysiology physiology of it, um, whether or not it can happen in uh, type 2 diabetes, that sort of thing. And so this next uh, part of the session will be going through a uh, case. 
And so these are the same three patients as we saw earlier. So the first patient, 50-year-old gentleman, three days of fever, shortness of breath, and a productive cough. Um, so immediately from that history, you need to, th need to be thinking about the differentials, what it's most likely going to be. So in this case, um, the most likely... Uh, the most likely pathology that's going on is going to be a pneumonia. So I'll keep that at the back of my mind. Also, bear in mind that his SATs are about 89% on room air. Um, he may or may not have COPD, so that may or may not be normal for him, but it's always worth erring on the side of caution, just thinking, oh, he's slightly hypoxic uh, at the moment. The next one is an 80-year-old lady on the ward. She's got uh, cyanosis with uh, very noisy breathing after being started on Comoxiclef for a catheter-associated UTI. Her heart rate is 120, respirate 24. She's uh, got a blood pressure that's quite low, 85 over 60, and low saturations on room air. So from this, the stem is sort of screaming out at us that this might be an anaphylactic reaction, or most likely will be an anaphylactic reaction. Um, and all her OBS are very deranged, and so this patient I'm very worried about because anaphylaxis is going to cause swelling of the upper airway, the lower airway, um, and it's going to tank the blood pressure as well. So they can get very unwell uh, very quickly, and they can arrest within minutes. And so in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, anaphylaxis, this is probably going to be the patient I'm going to see first, but just need to keep an open mind. The third patient, 85-year-old, uh, 85-year-old man who's been medically fit for discharge, waiting package of care. His daughter wants to speak to you because uh, she's not happy with the with what's happening. Um, and so this is uh, just, you need to make sure that the patient is truly still medically fit. Just ask a few triaging questions. Are they, do they look unwell? Uh, what are the ops like? Just to make sure that you're, you're not missing anything. Um, and the sad reality is that this is, not a clinical, not a clinical urgent, uh, not a clinical priority for you right now because you've got two quite, um, quite unwell patients that you need to attend to first. Um, and so this will likely be the last patient that you'll prioritize to see. And so this is what you need to be thinking about. First one has a breathing problem, likely a pneumonia. Second one is a um, patient with likely anaphylaxis, airway problem, big sick. You need to go and see them right now. The last one's just an, it's an angry relative, which, which will have to wait. Um, and so because we're going to see the second patient first, we need to sort of tell the nurses dealing with the first and third patient um, what our plan is. So um, I, what I would do is tell the nurses that um, I've actually got a very unwell patient on a different ward that I need to attend to ASAP. Um, I will come and see your patient. So for the first one, I, I think that they, are, they have got a pneumonia. So asking the nurse to start them on some oxygen, titrating uh, them from 94 to 98%, and getting all their notes um, by the bedside, getting their OBS chart, um, and doing 15 minutes OBS whilst I'm uh, seeing this other patient, just to make sure that they don't get much more unwell in the interim. Um, and they can also you can also ask them to get IV access whilst uh, waiting for you. Um, for the third patient, what I would do is um, briefly explain to the nurse that um, apologies that um, I've got two clinically unwell patients, so I need to see them first. I will get to, I will hopefully try and speak to the daughter, um, but this will have to wait until I've done with all the clinical jobs for the other two patients. And so this is the same stem as the second case earlier. Um, and so these are the OBS, um, and that's what the nurse has told you. Other things that you want to know is, like I said earlier, the name of the patient, what the hospital number is, in case you have electronic notes and you can uh, sort of have a brief look um, from afar. And you also want to know exactly where the patient is so you can be efficient, go there straight away. Um, what I would also want to check is if they have any allergies, if they've, if on their drug chart, they're known to have a penicillin allergy and they've been given Comoxiclef, that would be, you know, make your diagnosis very simple. Um, uh, but so it's always worth checking the allergies in a case like this. In this case, the, the nurse responds to you saying that, um, 
the patient doesn't have any known drug allergies on the drug chart. And this is the first course, the first uh, dose of the comoxiclav that they've uh, been given whilst an inpatient here. And before you see the patient whilst they're still on the phone with the nurse, you want to think about what can be done uh, right now by the nurse while, um, while I make my way up to the ward to see this patient. So at this point, um, you want to say to your examiner, you know, based on this stem, I'm very concerned that this is an anaphylactic reaction, very time sensitive, and I need to uh, see this patient ASAP. I will tell the nurse to uh, remove the trigger. So if they've been, if they're having an infusion of an antibiotic or a different drug, I will tell the nurse to remove that. I will tell the nurse to give them a dose of I am adrenaline because I have a very high um, index of suspicion for uh, for anaphylaxis, and it's very time critical to give the adrenaline. So I want to get the nurse to give them 500 micrograms of one in 1,000 concentration of adrenaline. Um, ASAP. And it's important to realize that there are certain drugs which don't need a prescription to be done for the patient to receive them at the moment, at that time. So adrenaline is one of those drugs because it's very time sensitive. And so uh, you tell the nurse that, you know, I'll, uh, you, you need to give the adrenaline now, I will sign for the prescription later. Um, and, you know, they are well within their rights to, to give the adrenaline. Other things you can ask the nurse to do once she's done the first two steps is to try and get IV access um, with the patient, so a large bore cannula through the antecubital fossa on both sides. This will save a lot of time later on when you're actually there with the patient. And if they manage to get uh, send some of the bloods, for example, a venous gas, they can get the results quite quickly. And so that will be very useful in your assessment to have. And last thing to note is that you want to tell the nurse to sort of gather the notes, make sure that everything's ready for you when you arrive so that you can quite easily synthesize all that information. Um, and then once you're there um, in front of the patient, you want to go through your A2E. So um, for me, what I would say is, um, first of all, I want to take, I want to go through the patient. I want to assess the patient using a systematic A2E approach. I'm going to assess their airways. Um, so first of all, I would like to introduce myself to the patient, see if they are responding to me. Um, and if she, uh, given that she's likely not to, going to respond to me, I'm going to do a look, listen, feel approach. And from this, um, the information given back is that uh, our 80 year old lady Doris is struggling to breathe. She, you can hear very loud stride or from the end of the bed. Um, and when you look inside her oral cavity, she's got no secretions. And you note that it's been five minutes since the first adrenaline dose. And so at this point, you've identified a problem. She's got stridor. Um, she's, um, she's got lots of, uh, she's in respiratory distress, really struggling to breathe. Um, and so you need to do something about that. So you need to give them a second dose of the IV, the IM adrenaline, another dose of 500 micrograms, um, just because the first dose was given about five minutes ago. So you're all in the clear to give the second dose. Um, and once you've given that, you need to think about trying to maintain her airway. So um, for this, uh, because she's going to have lots of swelling in the upper airway, you need to try and relieve some of that, um, some, some of that by opening it up. So want to do some airway maneuvers, head tilt, chin lift, um, or a jaw thrust. For uh, patients like this, you can consider using an airway adjunct um, or if they are truly, truly unwell and they're really cyanotic, they're not responding to the adrenaline, you need to bleep ITU ASAP to get um, to get them intubated so that you can maintain their airway whilst you try to get the anaphylactic reaction under control. So after your initial, after your second dose of adrenaline and after performing a head tilt chin lift from this patient, the uh, you note that the stride dose improved. It's still present, but uh, much more reduced than previously. And she's got... Um, she's less. She's in less respiratory distress. She's working less hard to breathe right now, and so we're relatively happy with airway. Uh, so we can move on to assessing their breathing. And so, 
Again, taking a look, listen, feel approach. So you note that the patient's not cyanotic anymore. Uh, there's no accessory muscle usage. Uh, the trachea is central and non-deviated. She's got equal uh, chest expansion. Um, and on auscultating the chest, you note mild stridor, which you could hear anyway um, without auscultating. She's also got a widespread wheeze, which is not uncommon with anaphylaxis. And when you percuss the chest, uh, it's all completely normal. Um, the obs that you've been given is that she's got a um, she's got a oxygen saturations of ninety percent on room air, she, and she's got a respirate of twenty four, which is slightly increased. Um, and so, things that you want to do at this point is to get an arterial blood gas. So, um, and that's shown on the side. This shows that she's got. Um, reduced PC, PO2, so she's in type 1 respiratory failure, and you've requested the chest x-ray, but it's going to take a while to transport the patient or to get the portable x-ray to come over. And so what you want to do for this patient, you note that she's hypoxic, um, she's in type 1 respiratory failure, so you want to start giving her oxygen ASAP, so uh, putting her on 100% oxygen by a non rebreathed mask um, would... Um, likely bring up her oxygen saturations. She's, it's also worth starting some nebulizers for the wheeze, and that will also uh, increase the, the aeration of the lungs. So she'll be able to, ex um, be able to uh, ventilate her lungs better and be able to extract more of that oxygen from the, the air that you, the oxygen that you're giving her. And again, at this point, you want to reassess after you've given the oxygen, after you've given the nebulizer, um, you note that this patient's strido uh, and wheeze are improving. She's got a an oxygen saturation on ninety of ninety six percent, which is much better now. And so you can start to think about sort of weaning down the oxygen, putting her on some venturi masks to see if she, that if she can come off or if she can get less oxygen while still maintaining her oxygen saturation saturations. And then next, you want to move on to assess her circulation. Uh, so you're going to uh, check her. You're going to check her OBS. So you you found that her heart rate is 120 beats per minute, uh, blood pressure about 95 over 68. Um, and on assessment, she's got no edema, dry mucous membranes. Um, her cap feels prolonged. Uh, she doesn't have a fluid balance chart. She's got a catheter in situ, um, and the nurse has inserted two large bore cannulae into the the ACFs. And they've also sent off some bloods very helpfully. So they've sent off a barrage of tests. Um, they've also done ECG, which shows just sinus tachycardia. So for this, for the circulation, what you can do and what has been done is that you've got uh, uh, IV access, which is very important because you need to start fluid resuscitating this patient. So in this lady, um, assuming that she doesn't have a history of profound um, heart failure, you want to start with 500 mils of uh, fluids um, and keep giving that until her blood pressure is in, in, a, in an acceptable range. So maybe about 110 to 120 would be quite good. And that's what we're trying to aim for. Some other things that you can do to increase the blood pressure quite quickly is to raise the legs of the patient either manually or just tilting the bed upwards. And the reason why this works is because you're increasing the venous return. You're helping uh, helping the veins sort of bring back blood into uh, into the the heart, so that it can be redistributed. Um, and so then moving on to assessing the disability, you do a quick GCS score. She's GCS fifteen at the moment. Um, she her pupils are equal and reactive to light, four millimeters in diameter. Her glucose is nine point six. And her temperature is 38.2 degrees Celsius. And the reason for this, um, if we think back to the original stem, is because she was being she was going to be treated for a catheter-associated UTI. So this temperature is likely associated with that uh, infection. So you just need to bear that in mind. And then when you expose the patient from top to toe. Um, you have a look at the skin. There's a widespread um, urticarial rash noted throughout the body, uh, throughout the limbs, throughout the torso. 
this is consistent with anaphylaxis, which uh, makes you even more confident with your original diagnosis. Um, you have a look at the abdomen. You palpate it, soft, non-tender, bowel sounds are present, which is fine. You note that she has a catheter in, and so you want to have a look at the catheter, look at what's draining, try to see how much she's passed in the last hour or so. And what you've noticed is that there's very cloudy, very turbid urine. And these are all, this is a sign of, uh, of a urinary tract infection. And so now that we've got a clear picture, we think that she's still, she definitely does have a anaphylaxis and she probably has a catheter associated UTI, uh, which we tried to treat with Cormoxiclav, but obviously she's had the anaphylaxis. So you need to think about treating her for the, the UTI um, at this point um, and bearing in mind that she can't have any pen penicillin-based antibiotics. So in an interview, I would say to the interviewer uh, that for uh, this patient, she's got a catheter-associated UTI. I need to start treating that, but I'm wary that she's now she now has a proven um, severe reaction to penicillin antibiotics. So I'll need to consult my trust my trust guidelines as to which antibiotic would be appropriate to start. And then once you've gone to your E2E, you want to quickly summarize the case um, as if you are presenting it to your senior. So for this, I would say, I've got Doris, she's an 80-year-old 80, 80 female on the geriatric ward. She initially had no known allergies. She was given a first, first dose of Comoxiclav earlier this evening for a catheter-associated UTI, and she's developed what sounds like an anaphylactic reaction. We've given her two doses of IM adrenaline um, with good effect. She's currently still on high flow oxygen, and we've been given her fluid boluses and her blood pressure is perked up from that. Her OBS are now stable. I've started her on alternative antibiotics for her catheter-associated UTI. Um, she will be on sort of 30 to she'll be on 30 minute observations while she's still in this um, acute period. Um, and is there anything else that you'd like me to do? And so at this point, you know, your registrar might say, oh, you should do this, this and that. And so you need to take that into account. So other things after you've escalated to your senior, after you've summarized to them, is to start thinking about any additional tests that the patient may need. So in a case of anaphylaxis, um, what they quite like doing is to get mast cell tryptase levels, um, which will be useful for the allergy clinic, for the immunologist to prove that that was indeed a true anaphylaxis reaction rather than an anaphylactoid reaction or anything else. You need to closely monitor the patient, 30-minute OBS at the bare minimum, because with anaphylaxis, they usually have a biphasic, they can have a biphasic um, reaction, uh, so they may slip back into anaphylactic shock again later. You want to uh, have a look at the drug chart and prescribe all the medications that you, you given, you've been giving uh, during the resuscitation earlier, including fluids and oxygens, and oxygen, which must always be prescribed. You want to take a few full history from the patient and you want to document what's just happened to the patient. And you want to add in that now Dave, they have a penicillin allergy and just note that it was the sort of the allergy severity is uh, very severe. It's anaphylaxis, doesn't get much worse than that. And then lastly, you want to update the nurse, keep them in the loop, tell them what your plan is, what your thoughts are, um, and also update the patient's family. And so that's just going through one case. Um, some deaneries uh, like Oxford will just, they won't give you a, um, a few cases to prioritize. They'll just give you literally single cases and ask you to talk about them. And to think about uh, what kind of stuff that you need to prepare for, I've added in a list here of some of the more common topics that will come up and these ones, you definitely will need to know how to manage all of them. So be able to, you know, when you're practicing, be able to talk through the initial resuscitation of all these uh, conditions um, it will be very good so that you won't get surprised on the day of your interview. Okay, and um, that's all I have to say about the clinical station. Um, and now if anyone has any questions, you can just pop in a chat or if you want, you can unmute and 
um, ask it to me directly. And there's a feedback link here as well um, with a QR code. And I've left my email address and the uh, access the SFP's email address as well. So if you have any questions about either of our talks today, just email either myself or the or the uh, access the AFP email. Amazing, Andrew. Thank you. Um, do you just want to keep up that QR code just while we chat? Oh yes. So people will have a chance to, yeah, if you guys could please um, just scan that QR code. It takes like 30 seconds to fill in. It's just some feedback. Um, it's really helpful for the guys that have spent a lot of time putting these presentations together and just gives us um, some feedback generally for the course. Um, so we know that we're doing things in the right way or we can take on any um, new bits and bobs. Um, so open to any questions. Um, there's one that's just come in um, asking, the clinical topics available in the Oxford handbook so um yes I mean everything covered in the AFP interview um SFP interview um you know all of those um clinical stations will be generally more standard emergency cases so stuff that you would be expected to know as a foundation doctor so you know it shouldn't be anything too left field so if you if you know the main emergencies from Oxford Hamburg should be okay. I think that's my understanding. Yeah, just to just to add to that, um, the Oxford Handbook is, I found, a very good baseline. Everyone should know everything in that the emergency section, but they certainly can and they they might ask uh, they might ask you things that are not covered in there. So that's why it's very useful to have sort of a good understanding of other topics. So, for example, in my Oxford interview. When I did it, I had an ischemic limb following a trauma, might have been compartment syndrome. And so it's just, you know, worth going, you know, going through your notes from the Hall of Medicine and Surgery, just having an idea of things yeah. that uh, may be asked and be, being able to talk about most clinical scenarios would be useful. Definitely. They, they will, um, especially if you answer things very well, they'll push you on your knowledge. Um you know, don't don't be phased if, if you can't necessarily answer. Um, I've been in interviews before um, where essentially they just keep pushing you till you run out of information to say. But at that point, you're, you know, you're scrabbling over one or two marks. Um, I think if you know the, the solid fundamentals and you present things well, um, you should get a lot of marks in there. Um, someone's raised their hand. Ada? Hi, sorry. Um, so first of all, thanks so much. That was really helpful. Um, but I just had a question on like, how this is all like portrayed online like is it through slides like you were demonstrating just now or is it like other examiners verbal and like whatever you ask for or whatever actions you take then they like respond accordingly like i just wondered how that all worked That's so cool. from my interviews um it was and i assume this will vary by deanery to deanery but what happened in the ones that i've done is that they put up the initial clinical scenarios on the screen. So for London, they put up the three or four stations. You were given three or uh, maybe 30 seconds to read through it, make up your mind, and then they would take away that slide and then start talking to you. Um, I think Oxford did something very similar. They put it up briefly, um, the, the stem, and then they took it away. I think I've spoken to people who have had their clinical stem on the screen the entire time. Um, so it might be a bit variable even within each deanery. And in terms yeah. of whether or not they will, how you communicate the information. So sometimes what they, they do is they won't even give you any feedback at all. So you have to talk to your A2E without stopping. They're not going to tell you what the findings are. You just need to say, um, I most likely this is going to be my whatever I find. And this is how I'm going, I'm going to treat it. Um, other places, they may start putting up um, results on the screen as well. So all in all, it's very variable. Yeah, You should prepare think, for everything, really. Yeah, I, I think it'll be variable. Hopefully, they will give you a bit of um, information just how they're going to run it. Um, I haven't actually done the SFP ones um, like online, showing my age, um, but I did the CST ones and they, they gave us like a little quick rundown of how they're going to do it. Um, it's a slightly different when it's a... Uh, unit of application uh, they're a bit more um, under their own guise of um, how they want to run things um, but yeah just keep an eye out um, the other thing actually just 
expanding on, on something you mentioned, just in terms of an efficiency thing, um, in terms of asking for results, I would just bash through a bunch of your vital signs and immediate things you want to do, and then ask for all the salient points together. You'll find it much more efficient than um, stopping every five, 10 seconds for a new bit of information um, from my, my experience. Um, but it's personal preference, obviously. Um, but you might find it helps you flow. Um, any other questions? Um, so someone's asked, after handing over the first case, you expected to go through the A to E for the following two patients. Um, yeah, do so, you want to this one? Yeah, in, so from both my interviews that I've done, it was about two clinic, they had enough time for two clinical scenarios. So in our case, we definitely will be will be expected to go through the second case. And again, going through your A2E, except this time you can probably be a bit more brief because the examiner knows that you, you know, you have your structure in mind, you know the different parts of the A2E. And so you can try and rattle it off much more quicker. Um yeah, so two state two clinical scenarios is the is the norm, I think. Yeah, I think that's my experience as well. I think when you're going through the second A2E, um, either just do it really as fast as you can, because you've got to remember if you're just repeating the same words you've just said two minutes earlier, you're not getting any extra marks. So you kind of want to bash through that quite quickly. Um, well, I won't say that for definite, you're not getting more marks, but you're not showing them anything new, if you know what I mean. Um, you really want to get to the meat of that case and understand what's going on with them and give the management plan, et cetera. That's what's going to get you the points. Um, I think my experience as well as these kind of cases, they're often balanced. So there'll be different things that they're trying to get you to focus on. Um, so there might be clinical things with different aspects of the A to E that um, has management points to talk about. Um, or there might be a, a, a station, uh, a case which has, say, um, like more kind of additional things, um, like ethical things to discuss about that case, which is slightly different. Um, so you go on a slight tangent. And there's another question. Um, can you make notes um, to remember the obs? I mean, you, you could, you could write them down. Um, to be honest, I would just practice holding them in your head. I know it's a pressure of the exam situation, but you might find it's slightly shifting your attention slightly and it's going to slow you down. Um, I really want to emphasize how quickly these stations go. Um, it sounds like it's very long and you know, you're know you going to be grilled for 10 minutes, but honestly, it will feel like 30 seconds. So whatever time you can save, um, not switching mediums and doing all of this stuff, um, is going to be better for you, in my opinion. But everyone works differently. So just practice and see what works for you. Yeah, for sure. Because uh, you want to be preparing quite a lot um, of these uh, for these scenarios. And uh, hopefully you'll get to the point that you'll be able to sort of pick out the important obs that you'll need for your for that specific station. Because um, most of the time you won't need all of them. And, you know, just having a general gist of the obs in your head would be good enough you don't need to know the exact numbers you just need to know oh their uh, their blood pressure is below 90 they're tachycardic they're hypoxic that sort of thing you don't need to know the exact numbers does anyone else have any questions Hi guys, I'm Owen as well. I'm another member of the Access to the SFP committee. Um, I had applications and in, uh, interviews with Yorkshire and Humber. I know that to echo everything what Andrew and Luke have been saying and Alex, that is about 15 minutes I had on the personal station and then 15 minutes on the um, on, on the actual clinical station itself. And yeah, it goes very quickly. Um, but yeah, as long as you keep your focus and you just clear and keep on reassessing, um, yeah, I'm sure you do really well. Amazing. So, um, yeah, just to, to drill in again, uh, this, like the clinical station is just practice, practice, practice. Um, like I said, at the start, the bar's quite high. There's not much room for error because, you know, there is a, a set right answer compared to like the clinical stuff, uh, the, the personal stuff, which is a bit more subjective. 
Um, this stuff you really can score quite highly on. Um, obviously, spread your time equally. But, you know, your A to E's, when you're driving to placement, um, when you're in the shower, literally just go through your, your A to E. So it's it's second nature. You're not having to think about it. And then you can spend all your mental energy in the interview just focusing on what the question is at hand. Um, and, yeah, just regarding the personal station, really um, don't underestimate this stuff. Uh, being able to talk about yourself and sell yourself and project yourself in a in a good way um, is is definitely the difference between a a good interview and a absolutely amazing interview, which is gonna which is gonna get you the place. So um, also take time to to go through those points that Alex was going through. So if there's no further questions, um, we can start wrapping up. Um, again, just make sure you're filling in this feedback for us. Really handy. Any questions, feel free to email us. And um, regarding mock interviews, um, which I'm sure a few of you are looking out for, we're going to be looking at um, sending these out um, via the mailing list sometime in the next week or two. So just keep an eye on there. And um, hopefully we can get as many people uh, a slot on these uh, mock interviews as possible. Thank you so much for your time joining us today, guys. Um, really appreciate it. Um, so we will finish there.